And there are uh, three additional books that I'd like to recommend to everyone. We don't have these on the table tonight, but um, they are, I think, important for tonight's session and some of them uh, even beyond. Uh, the first one is entitled Noah to Abraham. I'll, I'll leave these books up here so you can look at them uh, after the session tonight. This book has a wonderful discussion on what's called the Golden Age. Uh, right after the flood, immediately after the flood, um, the earth went through, according to the creation model, a, a period of time where everything came back very quickly for various reasons. Um, and uh, he, he addresses that issue here. It's very interesting. The other is The Tower of Babel, which is a very good book and describes some of the things that uh, we'll talk a little bit about tonight. And then finally, this is a technical book um, called Grappling with the Chronology of the Flood. And I would highly recommend this particular book if you're really interested in getting into the details of what was going on in those 371 days where the earth was covered with water. So, um, so there's some books that I would recommend uh, adding to your creation library, if you will. All righty, let's get to tonight's session. Tonight's session, um, for me, is an extremely frustrating one, and the reason for that is, is that there is so much information that we could discuss that we could have many, many sessions just on this particular topic. Now, you might say, well, well, that can be said of any topic that we're looking at. Well, that's true, but tonight it's, um, it's even more the case. We're going to be looking at the creation flood uh, narratives uh, in the book of Genesis, and uh, as you might imagine, there is a lot of information in these, so we're going to be just skipping on the surface. But the idea here that I'd like to get across is providing us a framework that you and I then can go to and develop the rest of the model, because I'm expecting you guys to take what we learn from these sessions and, and start putting the meat and the bone to your own, to your own study. So that's, that's the goal of, of these sessions. So our agenda tonight will be, we'll have a, we'll offer a few comments on hermeneutics, which is, uh, our usual case in this first, uh, half of the, uh, series. We're going to be looking at how we want to think about the biblical creation flood model. We'll take a quick examination of the creation narratives. We'll look at the fall of man and how that played an impact into the uh, bio system. Uh, we'll look at the antediluvian world. What was that like? That's a fascinating topic, and that's one of the reasons why it's so frustrating to have to skip uh, on, on the surface everything. Then we'll look at the flood narrative and, exa and uh, examine the extent of Noah's flood. This is a very important topic uh, for the creation model. And then finally, we're, we will look at the Peleg narratives and uh, what that all means in the biblical text and what we can glean from those things to as we develop our uh, empirical or scientific model. All right, let's first take a look at uh, hermeneutics. We saw, in fact, we've seen every session so far a discussion on hermeneutics, this idea of how do you and I interpret Scripture? How are we to understand the biblical text? Well, the ultimate goal of the regenerated student of Scripture is to ascertain the original meaning intended by the writers to the original audience. Um, I have a subscription to Biblical, Biblical Archaeology uh, Review. And in the last, I guess it was last week, there was an article by a, um, an archaeologist talking about the different interpretations of Genesis. And as I'm reading through, she's telling us how we, sh the many ways that we should approach scripture. We can approach it from an anthropological perspective, or a Christological perspective, or a feminist perspective, and so on. And I'm thinking, that is absolute nonsense. We want to uh, approach Scripture by using the same rules of grammar that it was written by. And then if we come up with a feminist perspective, then we can talk about it. But one doesn't approach Scripture with preconceived notions of things other than the rules of grammar and syntax that the Bible was written in or with. So, what was Moses trying to communicate to his original audience? That's the real question that we want to answer for ourselves when we look at uh, Genesis. Uh, 
So we must apply the same rules of grammar and syntax that Moses used when penning the Genesis text. And we've called these rules the normative hermeneutic. I really want to drive home, and I, I, we probably won't stop talking about this until the 15th session, which doesn't exist, which means we'll talk about it in every session. But this idea of hermeneutics is so important for the student of Scripture because it's the way in which you and I are to approach Scripture, and it's the way you and I can come to an agreement on what Scripture says. And so it's very, very important. So let's talk, talk a little bit about how you and I are to think about the biblical creation model as we're reading the text in particular and looking at various topics within the text, like uh, say for an example, um, biology or geology, how should we think about these things? Well, this little Venn diagram actually is kind of what we want to talk about. Um, if you consider this, the big blue circle as the entire creation model, Think of any topic or anything that you can think about that's related to this topic. Um, think of it as a as the sum of all these little submodels. Let's say the astro science model. How did you know? How does the how do stars and galaxies work? Uh, Geoscience model. How does uh, how did the continents get the way they they seem to appear today and so on? So there are these various submodels within the greater creation model that if you notice they all they overlap so they're all related to the, each other in some way or form so if we were to take our time and take all the little circles you would find that um the the big blue circle is a collection of all these little circles so so they're all part of the great greater creation model and they're all interrelated so you can see how the geoscience model and the bioscience model overlap and are therefore very much related. All right, so let's take a quick look at the, the creation narratives. And um, we'll look uh, quickly at Genesis 1-1 through 1-31, which I'm calling Narrative 1-A. And then Genesis 2-1 through 2-25, which I'm calling Narrative 1-B. And if you read a lot of uh, what I would consider liberal scholarship, they want to state that these are two different accounts of creation and that one account contradicts the other. But in fact, they're distinct, and it's an important distinction between the word distinct and different. They're distinct creation narratives, but not separate. The purpose for one is different than the other. They form a fundamental unity of description of creation. In fact, we would, have a, we would have a lot of missing gaps in our creation model if it wasn't for chapter 2. And, uh, of course, as I think I've said before, liberal theology becomes a game of who can disbelieve the most. And uh, many, many people are winning the game. All right, so let's take a look, a quick look at just a, a, a smidgen or a portion of Genesis 1 just to get our whistles wet because I want to use this text, and I hope everybody can see it, to um, bring to our attention some of the ideas that we uh, would like to know as we go through uh, the whole creation account. So we see, of course, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and morning were day one. Or as the King James translator said, first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So they are just the first two days of creation in Genesis chapter 1, and there is a plethora of information given to us here. Some of them, some of which I have uh, highlighted here for points of discussion. Okay, in verse one, in the beginning, it come. It's the English translation of the Hebrew word "better sheet," 
In the Hebrew, better sheet is articulated, so it's literally the beginning, a reference to the absolute beginning of space, time, and matter. So when we're looking at Genesis 1, 1 we are looking at the, the absolute creation of space, matter, and time. Now that's something we may not be used to thinking about. But before Genesis 1-1, time did not exist. Okay? And it's difficult for you and I to think about things before time existed, right? How do you talk about things before time existed? Because you and I are creatures that are trapped in space and time. So we need time. In order for me to stand here and walk to the other side of the stage, I need time, right? Well, before Genesis 1-1, it didn't exist. So how can we think about things before Genesis 1-1? After Genesis 1-1, we can think of chronology. Before Genesis 1-1, we can only think of logic. Chronologic, logic. So we can think of logical relationships between things and but not chronological relationships so that's the beauty about Genesis 1 1 now um, it's translated in the beginning for you grammar geeks out there this is in the dative case right uh, the object of the sentence uh, you know the direct object or the indirect object typically is what the dative case is but there's many different usages of the dative case you can be saying something like, um, you can be using the dative case for describing some, something's location. This speaker is in the room. Okay, that's called the locative, the location of the speaker. You can use it for the mechanism or the instrument by which you do something, and that would be translated here in Genesis 1.1 by the beginning. Okay. So the question is, how, do, how are you and I to translate this word? Is it in the beginning or is it by the beginning? The interesting thing is, from a theological perspective, it doesn't matter because both are correct. If, if we want to translate it in the instrumental case, that is, what's the instrument or who is the instrument by which God created, it would be translated by the beginning one. Referring then, of course, we can come to mind Genesis, uh, John 1, 1, okay? By the beginning one, that was the Logos from uh, Proverbs chapter 8 that we read last time. In the instrumental, or in the locative case, it would be in the beginning. And I think, frankly, it's correct. Uh, we won't get into the details, but I, I believe it's correct to translate it in the locative case, in the beginning. But it is interesting that from a theological perspective, both work. <laughs> okay, so verse 1 also says, in the beginning God, Elohim, which is the uniplural term for the Creator, uh, this verse screams of more than one member of the Trinity active in creation. As you recall, uh, Elohim is the plural term for God. In fact, I am is the plural ending in Hebrew. Shemayim. Our King James translators said, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, but the Hebrew says heavens. They should have translated that in the plural. And we know that Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians 12 by inspiration labels or enumerates three different heavens. The atmosphere of the earth is the first heaven, the universe is the second heaven, and then, of course, the third heaven is, excuse me, the ancient of days, the uncreated heaven, so to speak. We come to this word eretz, which is the Hebrew word for earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the context here, I want to make this point when you, because um, as you do other Bible study on your own, I want to make sure you know when to translate it earth and not something else. The context here in Genesis 1 is the entire globe, the earth, okay? And that's correct. Planet earth is the correct because that's the context. But very often, once Israel becomes a nation, the word Eretz refers only to the promised land that was given to Abraham, not necessarily the entire earth. And what you'll be, how you'll be able to tell that is through the context 
okay? Because the same problem is in the book of Revelation, where they use the word geo, our English word geo, to mean all the earth. But remember who they're talking to. They're talking to a Jewish audience. They're interested in the land. So we have to be very careful what the context is. So we want to establish the context so we know how to translate this word, Eretz in Hebrew and geo in Greek. So here we're talking about the entire globe. And then, of course, this Hebrew word bara, it's a singular verb, but it's modifying a plural subject, Elohim. So here we see the Trinity, and here we see um, one unified purpose, namely creation. Uh, verses 3 through 31, this is an important point that I think I've mentioned elsewhere um, in the first or second sessions, but um, we can give it a little bit more detail. Verses 3 through 31, if you remember, um, many of the verses begin with the phrase, and God said, and God took some kind of action. He saw the light, or he spoke, or something like that. Well, this construction, and God, and God, and God, is a figure of speech called a polysyndeton, many ands. Okay? And the purpose of this figure of speech is to tell you and I as the readers, pay close attention to the details of each set of subjects within the and. You and I don't have this figure of speech um, as, as, um, as readily today in English. We still have it, but it's rarely used. We use what's called an asyndeton. You know, if you're providing a list, say you're describing a home, and you're saying this home is yellow, small, green, wet. And each between each one of these characteristics, there's a comma, okay? And then at the very end, the list, you say comma and nice. That's called an asyndeton, no ands. The purpose of that is simply to build up and to characterize in one list the characteristics of the house. But the polysyndeton is telling you, pay close attention to each characteristic. So Moses is specifically using this figure of speech to tell you and I, pay close attention to everything I'm telling you between the ands. Okay, so that's, that's very important. And if we do that, it's amazing the amount of progress you can make in developing the creation model. And we're going to look at a few of those tonight. Okay, let's take an overview of Genesis chapter 1. Well, it turns out that Genesis chapter 1 describes seven days. We'll talk about the first six. Two sets of three days. The bottom set, as it turns out, provides the foundation for the second set. So the first three days, whatever God is doing in those three days, provides the foundation for what he's going to do in the next three days. Okay, so the bottom set provides the environments for the top set. So uh, on the first day, he created the cosmos, space, time, and matter, the space-time continuum, if you will. And what did he do with that? He put stars, galaxies, nova, and you name it, he, he has it in there. So the space-time matter continuum provides the framework and the environment for stars and so on. On day two, he created the ocean and the atmosphere. So um, birds, of course, fish, which he created on the fifth day. So day two provides the foundation for day five. The ocean is a fish, of course. The continent on day five, he creates dry land and vegetation. Day six, he creates the land animals and man to live in those environments. So you can see how the first day provides the foundation for the fourth, the second provides the foundation for the fifth, and the third day provides the foundation of the sixth. So the creation of the specific environment that we're talking about provides the details for the creation of the specific inhabitants of that environment. And um, verse seven, or, uh, day seven then explicitly states that God ceased from his creation. So by the end of day six, Everything that God was going to create was created. That statement provides a framework and a boundary for you and I 
um, when we create our, our model then. Let's take a look then at the, you can see how we're skipping over so much, isn't it frustrating? <laughs> the fall of man. Uh, let's take a look at, at this. We may spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's important not just for uh, the creation model but also for moral things, if you will. But there's some, so, there's some things here that I think are, that is very interesting that uh, we need to take home with us tonight. Um, the fall of man is contained in a single chapter. Isn't that interesting? A single chapter. Yet he spends, God spends books on the history of Israel. But only one he devotes to the fall. That's, that's an amazing thing. All right, Genesis 3, 1 through 25, uh, where we see the serpent, the Nakash, was wiser than all the beasts of the field. That phrase tells us, uh, it's, it tells us that this serpent that came to Eve was not part of this earthly creation. And that's a point that we've missed. See, we have the erroneous thinking that a snake slithered up to Eve and started talking to her. Um, that's not true at all. Uh, Satan came in his full-blown seraphic glory. I'm getting ahead of myself here. And I think we need to recognize that. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the curses that uh, went on Satan as a result of that. Satan violates due process of headship and approaches Eve directly in his full-blown seraphic glory. Now, why is it significant that we recognize that Satan came to Eve in his full-blown seraphic glory? Remember what we saw a couple of sessions ago. Who was Satan? Satan was the highest ranking of angel. He was the chief among the seraphim. And the seraphim were the rank of angels that are held specifically to protect the word of God. They, their abode is over the throne. And they are the rank of angels that came and purged Isaiah's lips, who was a man of unclean lips. So he purified Isaiah's lips, um, protecting, therefore, then the word of God that Isaiah was to receive and to write down and state. So um, this is the role of the seraphim, and they hover above the throne of the Ancient of Days. And Satan is the, the lead guy, so he's the head Head seraphim, the head seraph, I should say. So Satan, as the chief seraph, as the one in charge of protecting the word of God, he comes to Eve and corrupts, pollutes, twists the scripture. If you remember uh, what he said to her. And then Eve, of course, then goes on and twists it further. And she adds to the text, and neither shall you touch it, right? So there's a lot of scripture twisting going on here at the fall. Another significant thing about the fall is, where is Adam? When I, Before I became a Christian and became familiar with Genesis, the impression I got of the fall when we would discuss it at the church that I used to go to, I always got the impression that Adam was somewhere else in the, at the other end of the garden doing something, and Eve was over here all by her lonesome, and the snake came up and, and started talking with her. That's not, that's not the case at all. Adam was right there, right beside her, okay, watching this. So in a sense, he set her up. So Adam is setting up an experiment. He's the ultimate empiricist. Uh, Adam is setting up an experiment to see if, in fact, something happens to Eve. Because remember, they were told, look, you eat of this tree, you're going to die, right? What a loving husband. Do you really, do you think a husband who truly agapes his wife, self-sacrificial love, that's what agape love is, self-sacrificial love, do you think he would have set her up? He would have been running right to, he would have run right to uh, Satan and said, you do not have the authority to do this. Uh, you come through me. And he didn't. He just watched. I want to see what happens here. So, what is Adam doing? He's seeking autonomy from God, right? He wants to see is is, is she going to is something going to happen to her? I, I well, I, I could say some unusual things here, but I get a kick out of out of uh, in a sad way of uh, what is going on here. 
Well, when Eve eats of the fruit and Adam eats of the fruit, what happens? They die. Man spiritually dies, and he does this immediately. He physically dies in a progressive way. Man doesn't die like that physically, but he progressively dies. And what I find interesting here is that he's living in a perfect environment, or almost a perfect environment, and he lives so long. He still lives close to a 1,000 years, 900 and some odd years. You and I hope to make it to 70 today. All of creation now is subject to vanity, to this emptiness, to this uh, principle of the fall. So man brought about the complete corruption of the earth system. So creation is subject to man's fall. We know this from Romans 8. Uh, our pets, however, are not fallen. You might be happy to hear that, right? <laughs> but they've been made subject to the fall. And so, um, so that's an important point. So when man, man fell, uh, the very thing that he was in charge of was also impacted. So there is a moral part to this. Um, we can see this in certain, you know, when we look at culture and things like that, when a culture died, and I'm not speaking of God dealing in terms of nations today because he doesn't in a salvation way. He says today neither Jew nor Gentile. So the salvation that is being or should be taught today is a gospel that's not ethnically distinct, right? So when, um, whoops, when, um, so when man fell, he fell in such a way that everything that he was in charge of was also impacted. And this is an important thing to note. And that's why our pets and so on are uh, also in trouble and they eventually uh, die and decay. So, let's take a look at the antediluvian world and let's remember what we're looking at now. When we look at the antediluvian world, we're looking at a world that is after the fall. Okay? Um, we're looking at a world that has been impacted by Adam's fall and the curse that came about that, uh, about from that fall in Genesis chapter 3. Oh, by the way, I did want to mention, if Satan came in his full-blown seraphic glory to tempt Eve, then what was the curse about when it talks about you're going to be crawling on your belly? See, that's a lot, that's a thing that people use to say that a snake actually came to talk to Eve. That is, a, that is a figure of speech. And the Logos, Christ in his pre-incarnate form, explicitly stated to Satan, you are going to be eating dust, you're going, you're the, your fall, your humiliation will be so great, you'll be crawling in your belly eating dust. So when Christ announced that curse on Satan, he wasn't announcing a curse on some lizard that was going to lose its legs. He was referring to the humiliation of Satan um, toward the end, at the end, when Satan is finally defeated. Well, he's already defeated, but in his fall, he's progressively falling. And uh, you'll see this uh, in the book of Revelation. So by, by the end comes... By the end of the scripture, Satan is fully humiliated. And what does he do? He finally bows, bows the knee to a human being, a man, to Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, you are Lord. So that's the humiliation that Satan will be under. He will be crawling on the dust of his belly in front of a man. And that's the interesting thing. The very person he, the very sets of creatures he caused to fall, he ends up bowing down to the Jesus of Nazareth, the God-man. Okay, so that's the significance of the fall. All right, one of the things that we can claim uh, or show is that the hydrologic cycle in the antediluvian age was somewhat different. In Genesis 2, 6, but there went up a mist from the ground and the water of the whole face of the ground. So the hydrologic cycle was different. It was different in such a way that it produced massive amounts of lush vegetation all over the world. The other interesting thing 
about this statement is we can also create nutrition models. You know, if the water is coming up through the antediluvian geologic column, what is it bringing up with it? Calcium, magnesium, all these things you and I need for a healthy lifestyle, right? So these plants, no doubt, carried more of that today or then than they do today. Of course, we know many of our farms are kind of poor in terms of nutrition. So the hydrologic cycle was different than today. In fact, this is an area that I feel we creationists are a little weak. We need to do more research in this area. Um, very little has been done in terms of empirical modeling on this one particular topic, and I think that we're missing we're missing something in the model. So for you bio or for you geologists and geochemists out there, you have some work ahead of you. Okay, so we had lush vegetation all over the world. Abundant animal life, teeming, oceans teeming, seas teeming with life. Uh, the nature of nature was pleasant. Okay, um, You could stick your hand in a snake's home and he wouldn't bite, as opposed to what happened after the flood in Genesis 9-2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fish of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. And this is an interesting point because most animals, when they see a man, what's their first reaction? Even a grizzly bear, let's, let's get out of it, unless they're so hungry. <laughs> they need to eat. They want to get away from you. So generally speaking, the animal kingdom is afraid of man. They want, they want away from him. And so it was natural then, after the flood, for creatures to disperse throughout the earth. And i uh, give you one example. Have you ever wondered why so many marsupials are in Australia? Have you ever wondered? There aren't many, you know, the diversity of marsupials isn't as great here in, the North, in North America as it is in, in Australia. Any idea why, or can you think of anything? Well, for one thing, marsupials, when they have their children, what do they do? They put them in the pocket, in their coat pocket, so to speak, and they just keep going, right? So they can cover more ground than, say, a bear that has to spend time in a location and nourish their children and so on. So the marsupials can hightail it to further uh, distances than uh, typical, uh, typical land animals. And so you see a lot of them then in Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Okay, so see, so you can see how these little aspects of the creation model can help us make decisions or uh, answer questions that we might have in the world of uh, biology. Uh, Dennis, in two weeks or in two sessions, will be giving us a great uh, presentation on that uh, topic. Okay, increased longevity of man. We talked a little bit about this. We'll be talking some more. Uh, in the second half of this series, increased longevity of man. Man lived more than 900 years during the antediluvian age. The environment was different in such a way that uh, man did not degenerate as quickly. He did not uh, die as quickly, had a much longer life expectancy. The normal age, according to the geochronologies, as we saw last time, was about 908 years. <laughs> I could really get something accomplished if I lived. I'd go out and get a few more. <laughs> Methuselah, the oldest man recorded in the biblical text, 969 years. And it's interesting that the pseudepigrapha, some of the pseudepigrapha, which is the um, writings on the, about the Old Testament or on the Old Testament that um, clearly were not inspired, but they may, in, in fact, in, uh, include true history, they state that... Uh, Methuselah was not to die until the flood year. So the flood was not going to come until Methuselah died. And then, of course, we read in Genesis 6 that the sons of God tried to pollute the human genome and hence the flood. Now, you might think this is um, kind of what I call Star Trek stuff, real science fiction stuff. And um, But it turns out that the sons of God in Genesis 6 is a very important topic. And we shouldn't shy away from it because it seems unusual, okay? Um, 
because it says in Luke, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So just like it was in the antediluvian days, in everything, whether it be biology, geology, astronomy, and so on, sons of God, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So we need to understand who these sons of God are and their progeny to understand the goings-on during the last days of Israel. So I wouldn't shy away from it, but I would rationally look through through our normative hermeneutic, through the rules and regulations of grammar and syntax that the Bible is written with, and examine that text in a very serious way. And I would argue you don't have to go through all this crazy stuff that's on the Internet because it's the biblical text is awesome enough about what it's talking about here. But the purpose of the sons of God, why did they come to do this? Why did they try to corrupt the genetic line? Because of Genesis 3.15. Because the Messiah, the one who was to completely obliterate them and, and conquer them was to come through the seed of the woman. So if Satan and his unmarried band of progeny, or not progeny, but an unmarried band of um, angelic beings could corrupt the human genome, then Messiah could not come. And that was the purpose of these, the sons of God coming down to, to the earth and pollute the human genome. And uh, they came quite closely because the Hebrew seems to indicate, I won't say this dogmatically, but it seems to indicate that the only true human beings left on the earth were those in the ark. Because Genesis 9 compares Noah and it says that his door, his genetic code, was pure and it's in context with all the other humans. And it's rather kind of an interesting thing. Okay, let's take a look then at the flood narrative. Genesis 7 through 8, uh, verses 1 through 15, talks about Noah finishing and placing the animals in the ark. It took seven days. Noah enters the ark and Jehovah shuts him in in uh, the ark, according to Je Genesis 7, 16. So what we've learned from the last several sessions, which member of the Godhead came to earth and actually locked the door behind Noah? I think we know who that was. So the flood begins. It begins with the fountains of the great deep breaking up. We'll, we'll see this in a little bit later here tonight. And then the network of windows are opened up. Now it's important to recognize that the majority of flood waters did not come from the rain, but rather came from the fountains of the great deep. And so these are things that we can use when we create our empirical models of, of, uh, of our geologic or geophysical model. So this is a lot of good information that we can use to determine a nice empirical model. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, the waters rose. The ark begins to float. And the waters covered the entire earth, according to verse 19 of chapter 7. All the land and air creatures died according to 22. And the imagine this, the entire antediluvian civilization of humanity died in chapter 7, verse 23. Everyone was destroyed, killed. That's an incredible thing. And when you go through some arithmetic to determine or ask the question, well, how many people actually were on the earth at the time of the flood? If you use simple arithmetic, you can get as many as 3 billion people. If you figure it out, you're living 900 years. The, just, the, uh, the um, childbearing years of, of an antediluvian woman was much longer, in the order of hundreds of years. The Genesis text talks about antediluvians having many sons and many daughters. Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters besides Cain, Abel, and Seth. That's where, those, they, that's where Cain got his wife, one of his sisters. And it's okay to do that when, you're, when the genetic genome is pure, right? You can do that. We can't do that today, but they could then. Okay. 110 days, um, the waters began to recede and, and abate. Uh, and this is another important thing that I think we creationists tend to forget about. There was a wind after the flood. The wind is present as the ground appears. 
And that wind, God sent that wind, I think, for a purpose. One was to spread seed throughout the earth. And that was one benefit of having a wind. Another was drying the earth out. And there's other reasons that there are other things that that wind would have done. The ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. So if you imagine now, as the waters come down, these newly formed mountains, the water comes down and the ark lays there. And I would argue that the mountains probably were not as high then as they are today because a lot of the mountain building took place after the flood. But obviously the mountains took place during the flood as well. Seventy-four days, the waters continue to recede. The mountaintops, more mountaintops become visible, according to eight, chapter 8, verse 5. And then Noah waits 40 days to send out a raven. Uh, Noah sends out the first dove, uh, which, according to chapter 8, verse 8, returns to the ark. So this dove couldn't find any, uh, any land or anything to land on, so he returned to any place that he could go. Uh, Noah sends out, or, or life, uh, something to eat. Noah sends out a second dove, which returns a newly sprouted olive leaf. Now that's an important thing. Remember what I said about Eric von Fong's book, Noah and Abraham, where he talks about the golden age of um, the earth making a comeback very rapidly? Here we see the biblical data that would tell you and I that's what's happening. Okay, Because we're only looking at a year a year and things are starting to um, germinate and so on. Now we could get into, uh, and we may even talk about this when we get into the uh, empirical model in the second half, but if you imagine these vegetation mats floating all over the uh, flood waters, they eventually land on ground and they could possibly have things growing on them very quickly because it's a very rich uh, environment for these things to grow. Um, so uh, so the dove uh, comes back with a newly sprout, sp sprouted olive leaf. Uh, Noah sends out the third dove, and he doesn't return. So he found food and a place to rest. Uh, after 29 additional days, Noah removes the covering from off the earth, according to verse 13 of chapter 8. Then 57 days later, Noah, his wife, and the, his sons and daughters-in-law leave the ark. So they leave the ark somewhere around the mountains of Ararat, somewhere in, the, in what we would call modern-day Turkey or Armenia, somewhere in that area. Then the text also says later that they moved toward the east. They went to the land of Shinar, which we know today as modern-day Iraq. So Noah removes all the animals from the ark and they hightail it out of the ark and try to get away from these guys that caused all this uh, craziness to begin with. Here we see a uh, chronology of the flood in kind of graphical form. And the important thing to recognize here is the flood lasted in its major form by the time Noah got into the ark and the time he could get out, about 371 days. So about a year, the entire geologic column, well, I'll say 99% of the geologic column, was formed in a year. And uh, that's rather remarkable. Okay, let's take a look at the extent of Noah's flood. Frankly, when I read the biblical text, just at face value, I would never have considered that the flood that we're talking about in chapters 7 through 9 was local, okay? But a lot of people have maintained that it was a local flood. Here are some evangelicals, some so-called conservatives that want to maintain that the flood is local. Bernard Rand, a major evangelical scholar in the middle 20th century. Arthur Custance, another major reformed uh, scholar of the middle century, and he's done a lot of good work actually in some other areas. Uh, B. Kidner, John Warwick Mon Montgomery, uh, who was big in looking for the ark in the late 60s and early 70s. Davis Young, who's a professor of geology at uh, Calvin College and uh, I believe Calvin Seminary, a geologist, the son of the great E.J. Young, a young earth 
global flood defender, but his son is a local flood uh, gentleman. And then finally, we have Hugh Ross, who today is a big promote, proponent of the, the local flood theory and, um, and uh, among other things. So we can see that this issue is a, a very important issue among evangelicalism. And uh, how do we want to approach Scripture? We want to approach it using the same rules of grammar and syntax that it was written with. And it can be shown that every one of those gentlemen have violated that principle somewhere along the line. So given Moses' description of the flood, the normative hermeneutic demands that the flood of Noah be global. Just the general context of the language requires this. It's not an option. It's not something you and I can, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you do that. You know, you'll let me do this. No, no. It actually demands that the flood be global. Moses using the Hebrew word mabul over other Hebrew words used for local flooding demands the global nature of Noah's flood. Okay, so again, if you and I apply the normal meaning to words, the conclusion we would come up with is we're looking at a global flood. An ark would be unnecessary if the flood was local. Just move to another place. <laughs> really, come on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is how silly some of these so-called academic questions are. I mean, really. Uh, uh, given the normative hermeneutic, the fundamental purpose of Genesis 17 and 18, 7, 7, 18 and 19, is to de describe a global flood. And this is the importance of figures of speech. And it's a shame we don't appreciate figures of speech today because they're not taught at all. There's a figure of anadiplosis used in, in Genesis where the beginning of the sentence and the, be uh, sorry, the end of the sentence of sentence n and the beginning of sentence n plus 1 use the same words. And the purpose of this is to emphasize the context and the content of what's being talked about. Okay, And then the figure of epizuxis is a, is a uh, figure that you and I would use to um, amplify the, the degree to which we're talking about something. Okay, So when we're talking about the flood, these figures of speech are being used to amplify the fact that the entire earth is underwater and being impacted by the fountains of the great deep and so on. So the fact that these figures of speech are being used in such a way makes it, I hate to say, an open and shut case. And it's kind of sad because one of the great Greek scholars at the early part of the 20th century, A.T. Robertson, you know what he said about the study of figures of speech? It's on page 1258 of his big grammar. It's like this. I think it's 1258, somewhere in that frame, framework, that area. He said, the study of figures of speech is the rattling of dry bones. And that's a real shame because it kind of makes language then just dry, like dry bones. And it shouldn't be that way. So figurative language is used to amplify ideas and make the discussion more interesting. And it's never to hide and put things in a mystery. And then, of course, we see that under the whole heaven, <laughs> it's not part of the heaven, not just under Allegheny County, the whole heaven. Okay. In a local flood, not all plant life is destroyed. But we read in Genesis, all plant life is destroyed. In a local flood, animals can move to a higher ground or out of the area. In a local flood, birds can fly to other locations. <laughs> Isn't that true? In 19, I think it was 86, if you remember, there was a major flood up in the North Hills on Route 8. And uh, that made national news, if you remember that. And, um, well, not everybody died. I even went down to, to look at the place. And the whole valley in Route 8 was underwater. Uh, but I was still living. And so there were a lot of people that were there. In a local flood, not every man dies. Some can escape to safety. Even the tsunami that, hurt, that hit Indonesia, what, several years ago. Not everyone died. They hightailed it away from that. The rainbow, and this is a wonderful argument. If Noah's flood was local, then God violated, has violated his rainbow covenant many times. I mean, that's... 
that argument alone is good enough to say the flood had to be local, otherwise God is a liar. And see, theologically or logically, that's what these people are saying. That's why these things are so important. I mean, really, if you want to claim that what Genesis is talking about is a local flood, then the rainbow, you're, you're, you're logically telling us that God is a liar. And these guys don't understand that, if I can be nice about it. The inspired commentaries of Second Peter and the writer of Hebrews screams of, a, of the flood's global extent. So, um, the flood had to be global just by the context and what we read in uh, Genesis and elsewhere. The nature of nature changed after the, glo of the flood of Noah. You know, if it was just the local flood, think of this. If it was just after a local, uh, if the flood was just local, why would you stick your hand in a, an asp's hole and expect to be bit? If it was a local flood, maybe if you were in the area of the flood, maybe 30,000 years later, 3,000 years later, the snake. But over here where the flood didn't take place, why would the snakes change their nature? Okay, so these things speak of a global flood. And frankly, folks, the geologic evidence that we'll be looking at, and probably you've seen so uh, the, of a watery catastrophe all over the earth, is just mind-boggling. When you fit the continents up, the stratigraphic record fits. I mean, the entire geologic column that we know about today and see on a globe that we'll see later here was all laid down in the flood. And uh, so, and that wasn't local. Okay, so much for the flood. Uh, let's take a look at the Peleg narratives. After Noah's flood, the earth was in the process of settling down to a steady state condition. It continues in this process today. Um, you know, people, you know, the earth is drying out in case <laughs> uh, things aren't as, you know, the, um, the area around the Grand Canyon, that was, there were lakes there shortly after the flood. The Grand Canyon was formed probably about 500 years after the flood. But there were massive lakes in the area of Colorado and Utah. The area was lush. Uh, Sahara Desert, you know, when uh, Abraham went through there, um, God said the, the Middle East there was a land of milk and honey. Not quite that way now, but that whole area of Africa was a nice place at one time. But as the, area, as the earth dries out, as the so-called glaciers move north, less rainfall in the area, the Sahara Desert grows south. So the Sahara Desert is a post-flood phenomenon. An event took place that is described, of course, now in Genesis 10.25, and we'll read this text here because we're talking about the so-called Peleg experience. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. One condition resulted from... And one condition was affected by the Peleg Division incident. Number one, continental drift and the breaking up uh, of what is called Pangea. It's almost impossible to ignore the association with this Hebrew word Eretz. But I would argue that the Hebrew word Eretz is actually using, used, being used purposely in two different ways. One to talk about the land, the other to talk about languages. And I think that is the solution to the whole confusion. So, the confusion or the mix-up of man's languages, because prior to this, prior to the Tyre of Babel, they were all one language. So, as a result of this Peleg event, languages were divided and so were the continents. Okay, But I would argue, and uh, we could get into this maybe in the seventh or eighth session whenever we look at the geo model, that the actual breakup of the continents took place toward the end of the flood, okay, as we saw when we were talking about mountains, because those mountains had to be formed by continental movement. So the Ararat Mountains were caused by continents moving, and the ark rested on them. Okay, so we're looking at continental drift, and we're looking at the Babel confusion. So let's take a look first at the continental drift. <clears throat> 
On the Eber, of course, were two born two sons, and this division took place in his day. Now, if, we, if you remember what we saw a few sessions ago, we saw Eber, who, is the, who, was na- who the Hebrew people were named after. He was the last patriarch that had an unusually long life expectancy, 400 years. His sons, Peleg and Joktan, lived slightly over 200, which to you and I is long, but it literally was half of what their father's was. So the earth, or in this context, the land mass, was divided. Okay, This refers to the physical breaking up of the post-flood geography. The text does not give us the mechanism of the breakup, however, which gives you and I a framework by which we can create our empirical models on how this breakup took place. And when we look at the geoscience model, what we're going to do is we're going to very quickly review the various models that creationists have offered over the years uh, for their for this not just not just the continental drift uh, phenomenon but the uh, the whole uh, geologic model and then we'll focus on one and I've chosen that one because it's been uh, submitted more to peer review than any of the others so here we look here we see a um, an ex- a picture of what uh, the continents might have looked like uh, you can see that if you put them all together here they uh, they were formed they formed one land mass so after the flood all the land was in one area here now that it in itself would scream of a mechanism how does all that land get placed into this one area you know so that that says something that should tell you and I how how we can begin creating our model then when this division took place, it started dividing these various pieces apart, as we can see here. Now the arrows, I assume you can see the arrows, they are pointing in the direction where that particular part of a continent is moving. So these areas here, say for example in South America, are moving southwest. Okay? North America is moving northwest. Did I say south? I meant southeast. This would be moving, uh, whoops, ooh, getting ahead. And um, so on. But notice how fast they're moving according to this particular computer model. They're moving at about one and a half, slightly more than one and a half meters per second. So that's kind of fast if you think about it. An entire continent moving at one and a half meters a second. That's a fast pace for all that mass. You can automatically think of a problem that that might incur. Heat. If you're moving, moving that much, much mass, you've got to dissipate that heat. That's a problem. So anyway, that is what uh, creationists have modeled uh, in some of the um, literature today. We'll get into this in more detail in our empirical session. This is what it looks like today. This is a CSAT satellite, and you can see Africa here, South America. You can cut. You can see how they've uh, moved apart. And what you can see here is what's called a three-dimensional scar, if you will. This is exactly, you see the mid-Atlantic ridge here. And you see the crack coming down in this way. And you also see these um, valleys, these gorges, that are exactly perpendicular to the, um, to the, uh, the mid-Atlantic ridge at various locations. That's exactly what you would expect to uh, find when you have a three-dimensional crack. Because you're going over a surface, and if you're cracking in this way, it has to split open like this. So these valleys that are running perpendicular to the actual fissure, the reason why they're doing that is so that the fissure can go around a surface. This is about a 40,000 mile fissure that goes around the entire Earth, uh, splits, com- comes back up this way, continues down here, all around uh, into the Pacific, and right up through the Gulf, the Baja Gulf here, right through uh, California, and up uh, the eastern uh, coast of uh, Canada, and so on. So this is kind of an interesting thing, but this is what the sea, ocean, floor, and continents look like 
today. This is all a result of the flood. So this, I would argue then, whatever or however the, this crack occurred or started, this looks to me like it would be a good candidate for the found, found, uh, fountains of the Great Deep, right? This mid-Atlantic ridge and the ridge that goes around the entire Earth in some fashion, okay? Now, if, here's another thing that we can talk about. Boy, this is getting frustrating there. There we go. If the northern latitudes, we'll just focus there, if the northern latitudes were all glaciated, a lot of water in those glaciers, right? That means the water table would have been lower all over the world. And if you look at this area here, in Indonesia and Java and so on, in this area, uh, creatures could cross from the Asian peninsula into, or the Asian continent, and make their way to Australia very quickly. Okay, so these are, these are some of the things we'll look at when we get to the empirical modeling of our geophysical model. Uh, is there anything else I want to say? Yes. I'll say this and then we'll continue on. Getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Um, notice Asia. Asia, above Asia is the Himalaya Mountains, right? Right here. Italy, the Alps, right here. Now, Italy moved north, if you will, the boot, moved into the European continent and formed the, the mountain range that we know of the Alps. Okay. India moved north into the Asian plate or continent and formed the Himalayas. Now, the mechanism for all this we'll touch later on, but this is basically some of the things that happen. Uh, this is the area right here in the Middle East where Eden supposedly is, and uh, the biblical text actually tells us which rivers um, were related to, to Eden at the time. So, this is um, a result of the flood, and there are some very interesting things that we can discuss. Let's take a look at the division of languages then. Remember, we're looking at this Peleg incident, and uh, we've seen two things resulting from it. The first was some kind of division of the earth. The second was division of the languages. In... Um, Genesis chapter 11, and the whole earth was one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. A terrible translation. should be toward the east. Because remember, they're coming from Turkey, modern-day Turkey, right? And they found the plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. In verse 4, and they said, let us go, uh, let, uh, go to, I'm sorry, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. There's a lot of theo bad theology in that verse, isn't there, on the part of the post-Diluvians. First of all, they didn't want to be scattered on the face of the whole earth, but yet that's what God told them to do. Now, why did God tell them to do that? It's because the earth was not meant to be left to the probabilities of the wind. You know, our modern-day environmentalist movement won everything to be left to the probabilities of the wind and let nature take care of it. That's not why God, that's not the purpose of man. Man's purpose is to take care of the globe. So by not going out and spreading over the earth, they were not fulfilling their hope of managing the earth, being the caretakers of the earth. But rather they wanted to stay in one place and make a name for himself. And it's kind of a shame because we have this idea that what these guys wanted to do was to make a tower as high as they could to reach heaven. That's not what the text is talking about. What they were talking about was the message that they knew from the zodiac. They wanted to make themselves gods. Because if you remember, the, uh, the zodiac is in fact a horoscope. It's the horoscope of one person, namely Jesus of Messiah. And the original intent of the Zodiac was to tell the coming of Messiah. The Sphinx. Now, you and I know the Sphinx from Egypt, but it's a, the, the meaning that we are familiar with is a corruption of the original intent. The Sphinx was, tell, was the keystone to understand the Zodiac, head of a woman, body of a lion. You start with the head of the woman, Virgo, and you read around and you come to Leo the lion. And with each one of the 12 signs, you have three attending signs which give detail of the major sign. 
Okay, so this is what they were trying to do. They corrupted the original intent of the Zodiac, and they wanted to become gods. And that's the significance of Nimrod. Okay, he wanted to become a god. So this same theme that was back in the antediluvian times is still with us right after the flood. And the other interesting thing about the biblical text, the history that the Bible tells us, is that man after the flood started out being Trinitarian monotheists. Okay, they recognized Elohim, they recognized Jehovah singular and Elohim plural, all that in their own language. But what does the Bible tell us? After a few generations, they abandoned Jehovah and they became pagans. So the Bible tells us that man went from a true view of God to a corrupted, to a pagan view of God. Evolutionary theory tells us the exact opposite, that we went from some animistic view to paganism to finally at the final top we have this Trinitarian monotheism that is the pinnacle of our view of God. What nonsense. Uh, the biblical text tells us the exact opposite, that they started out worshiping Jehovah and after just a few generations abandoned him. So, notice verse 7. As a result of this, well, let's start at verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord, singular, scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the, uh, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So oh, they're living their hope whether they like it or not. They're managing the earth, and I'm afraid that uh, we're not doing too good of a job of it all the time. So they were finally uh, scattered abroad as a result of judgment and not a result of living out what they were supposed to be doing. But understanding the Babel event is important in that way. They were not trying to build a tower uh, the size of the Sears Tower or the Dubai Tower. All right, so... The scattering of the people via the confusion of their tongues was almost contemporaneous with the breakup of Pangaea. As the continents moved apart, so did the people based on language and ethnic distinction. Uh, the technical term for this is biblical diffusionism, and this is an area that um, we need to do a lot more work um, in this idea of man being scattered abroad. Uh, the creation flood chapters then, if we can summarize, the creation flood chapters describes several catastrophes now. Creation itself, Noah's flood, continental drift, confusion of languages, and that's it. So the important thing I think to glean from tonight's presentation, and you can see how we just skipped on topics that it would have been nice to really delve into, is that within, within the Genesis chapters, there is so much information there that we can develop, sit down and develop a biblical framework that we can make predictions on how we ought to model the scientific world. And I think that's the important thing to glean from tonight's very high-level brief session. Next time what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a little bit more detail on the geologic model and the astronomical model from a biblical perspective. What information is there in the biblical text that you and I can use to create our, our empirical models? So that's what we want to get at to, uh, uh, after, at the end of this um, first session, or at the end of this first uh, part, uh, the biblical model. We want to be, a, be in a position where we can um, start thinking about these empirical models and how can we use the scientific method, if you will, to uh, construct ways in which we can empirically explain what we see in the real world and things like that. So tomorrow's, uh, or I guess it's next week, uh, we're going to be looking at the geophysical and the astrophysical models uh, from a biblical perspective. And um, it's going, I think, from my perspective, this is one of the most more interesting of sessions next time because we're actually going to be talking about things that um, give a lot of 
confusion to a lot of folks' minds. Um, relativity, quantum mechanics, you've heard of all these things, right? How is the Christian to handle them? And we're going to be looking at some of those things uh, next time.